back to the Fourth Way Podcast. So my family just watched the movie, uh, I think it's called The Christmas Bells, the other night. And it was it was a really beautiful movie. It was a movie that I wasn't expecting to really enjoy all that much because it's it's uh, not Hollywood based. It's more like theatrical. I think this uh, this company up in Pennsylvania that I, I grew up around and, and went to some of their productions uh, called Sight and Sound, they I think put on this um, this movie. And so I was kind of skeptical. I don't I don't usually like plays theatrical plays that are turned into movies but this one uh, about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's life and and particularly the the portion of his life centered around uh, this poem the christmas bells it was a be- really beautiful movie so for those who might be unfamiliar with uh, Longfellow and and this poem in particular uh, it's it's a really tragic time in Longfellow's life and he's been this great wonderful poet who's had this magnificent inspiration in his life and then his wife one of his primary inspirations she dies in a tragic fire and so he is he is in a depressed state the nation goes into civil war um his his son uh, against longfellow's wishes joins the army to fight in the civil war and so uh, and, and then his son gets uh, severely injured and and they even think he's going to die and so there there is just this questioning of God, of life, of hope, of all of these things. And it's it's in that portion of Longfellow's life that he writes this beautiful, beautiful poem called uh, Christmas Bells, which I, I strongly recommend that you go pause the episode and go read it now um, because I'm going to reference it quite a lot. Um, but before I, I really get into the poem and kind of dissecting it just a little bit, um, one of the things that, that I was reminded of um, from from reading the poem and from watching about Longfellow's story was um, just the hope that Longfellow had in God and and in the church, right? Because the, the bells that are ringing are the church bells which promise peace. So while I am somebody who loves the church and values the church, and in fact, my current job is, um, you know, the title is a church planter, right? I'm, I'm going... Uh, over to Romania and seeking to help churches grow, to plant churches. I strongly value the church. But, you know, as I, I look at the world stage, particularly, I, I mean, world history, if, you, if you've listened to uh, this season on propaganda or my season on government, um, I'm very skeptical of Christianity in, in terms of its uh, power mongering and, and the evil, great evil that it has done throughout the world. Uh, Christendom, as I would distinguish it from the church. And especially as I, I think right now of the uh, conflict in Palestine and Israel, um, and I think of the church in relation to that, especially the church in the United States, this dispensationalist church that um, you know is willing to allow all sorts of injustices, uh, will support Israel no matter what they're doing because um, you know they think that God must want that, and we have to usher in Jesus coming back or something like that. It's just, it's just sickening. Um, and so I, I was thinking a lot about about that. Uh, and with uh, with Wadsworth Longfellow's uh, with his Christmas bells poem, you have a. It's written in the context of a war. And this war that uh, is thought to bring peace because it's it's uh, in, in large part seeking to free the enslaved. There's this promise of peace through the assertion of power. It reminded me of another, I guess he's probably contemporary with uh, Longfellow, or at least close to the same time, but Mark Twain. He's got a wonderful short story, I guess, um, called the war prayer and uh in the war prayer twain you know shows all these imperialists who are um you know praying to god for victory in their war and then at the end of the story he has this wise old man who says hey let me tell you what you're really praying for and this old man prays and says i hope that their wives are bereaved and i hope that their children are slain in the streets you know things like that and he said look if you wanna, if you wanna keep praying for what you're praying for for this war, you go ahead and do it. But know what you're really praying for, 
<laughs> and at the end of the book, you know, Twain and his cynicism was like, and they all said, man, what a crazy dude, and just dismissed what, what the man said because they didn't want to see truth. Um, they were caught up in their religious and nationalistic fervor, which are so often one and the same. So as I was thinking about uh, Christmas bells in the context of the Civil War um, and, and this idea of peace, uh, as I was thinking about Palestine and just the, the horrible tragedy that's going on there right now, I was thinking about this war prayer, this these war drums, the beating of the war drums, uh, and then this irony that this Christmas there is conflict in Bethlehem, which isn't, uh, you know, Gaza per se, but, you know, it, it's Palestine, and, and there are effects in the West Bank as well that are, are coming from this. Uh, as everybody's looking at Gaza, um, Israel is, is uh, ramping up the, the horrors of what they're doing um, with, with the settlers in the West Bank as well. And so Bethlehem, if not as directly as Gaza, is under uh, oppressive rule or threat this Christmas. And so to think about Christendom's promise of power and to think about that in relation to Christ as the Prince of Peace and even reading some of the, uh, I'll link this in the show notes, but uh, the Palestinians having these these letters that are coming out and how they're declaring that the, look, the even the, the Christian community here in Palestine is largely nonviolent. Um, the a quote from from this paper that they wrote says, quote, although many Christians in the West do not have a problem with the theological legitimization of war, the vast majority of Palestinian Christians do not condone violence, not even by the powerless and occupied. Instead, Palestinian Christians are fully committed to the way of Jesus in creative nonviolent resistance, which uses the logic of love and draws on all energies to make peace. Crucially, we reject all theologies and interpretations that legitimize the wars of the powerful. We strongly urge Western Christians to come alongside us in this, end quote. And this podcast has explored quite a lot about this, this way that uh, a lot of Christians in Christendom have thrown off Christ's teachings and embraced violence, and how so often we do this for our own selfish ambitions. Um, we do it for today, especially for nationalism and power. So for this episode, um, I want to share with you a rewriting that I did of Longfellow's uh, Christmas Bells. And um, I rewrote it with trying to kind of keep the same sort of structure and, and concept, um, but I, I did change it up just a little bit. So I do want to evaluate the poem after I read it. But before I do that, uh, I want to just tell you a few structural elements to look out for. Um, so first of all, I kept the same rhyme scheme. So A, A, B, B, C is, is essentially the way that it, it works. And also, if you, if you read uh, Christmas Bell's poem, there is, he, in terms of his syllables, he does 88448. Four, eight. Uh, I kept that with uh, two exceptions. So in, in Longfellow's poem, his second stanza, where he, he uh, uses the phrase unbroken song, um, I don't know if he purposefully did this. Um, the rest of his poem is so structured that it seems like he must have. But that's the only line that kind of breaks uh, breaks the structure where uh, it actually goes 88458 eight instead of keeping the 4-4. Four, four. And it makes me think when he uses the word unbroken, it's almost like, oh, that's kind of like a, a play on the meter there. Like when you're, um, when you're changing it up to show that you just broke uh, broke the stanza, um, broke the structure, um, using the word unbroken. So I thought that was really creative. So what I did is um, I kept that 88448, except um, because most of the poem I'm going to read is talking about Christendom, which I think is broken, um, I'm actually going to use the 88458 structure for the vast majority of the poem. And then on the, po uh, on the stanzas where I talk about uh, the true peace of the church and things, uh, I will use the, uh, the rhyme scheme that sounds more fluid, the 88448. And I think uh, that, that you'll be able to hear it because you'll be like, oh, if you would have just removed that word or added that word, it would have been so much more fluid. 
And I think that's that's kind of why I wanted to do the you know the the broken meter, uh, the broken structure, uh, because it it should sound a little bit off because I'm talking about something that is very much off. So anyway, uh, here is my rendition, uh, my rewriting of Christmas bells, and I entitle it Christmas drums. I heard the drums on Christmas Day, cacophonous, tympanic display, their noise and treats with ideal replete of peace to us and death to them. I thought of how this day once came, the Son of God in manger lane, to show the world God's love unfurled of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till bumping, thumping drums of old called Christendom to caracol, promise of ease with no bended knees for peace to us and death to them. From the darkness of those ages, sloughed examples, broken pages, power was gained, and so was our fame. Now peace to us, and death to them. T'was as if God ne'er had spoken, had not lived out in the open. His will repined, his peace redefined, as peace to us, and death to them. In triumph, then, we raised our heads. There is now peace on earth, we said. For we have strength, go to any length, for peace to us and death to them. Then thumped the drums more loud and deep. God is not dead, he is asleep. In a manger, where lies danger, our peace on earth in Bethlehem. All right, so in, uh, in the first stanza, I, um, you know, I use this concept of drums, which... Uh, the, is supposed to indicate like the war drums, you know, you, uh, you've got that, that, that's a common ideology, you know, the beating of the war drums, um, and, and this idea that I put in there. So instead of the, the church bells, we've got war drums that the church is responding to. Uh, in the, the second stanza, I use the, the term love unfurled. And when you think of the word unfurled, like if you, if you look that up in general, you you tend to think of flags when you think of unfurling something, and so I, I put that imagery in there uh, because love unfurled is representative of the the kingdom of Christ, right? That is how Christ rules in His kingdom. That's the banner that He flies. Um, and so the the original uh, stanza too was about Christendom, and so I kept that in here by. Uh, talking about kingdoms, like the true kingdom of Christ. And so I, I actually contrast that here a little bit. Um, in stanza three, I use the the uh, idea of this Christendom's caracol. And um, a caracol is just like a, a turning of a, a horse. So if a rider caracols um, with their horse, they are just turning you know, to the right or the left or whatever. And so there I'm referencing this deviation of... Uh, that Christendom has from the way of Christ. In the the third, uh, I'm sorry. In the, uh, I also talk in the third stanza about this, you know, no bended knees, which is the idea that, um, you know, we are not going to submit to Christ, first of all, but also in in another sense, uh, we are not going to bow the knee because um, we are going to be in the position of power where we expect other people to bow to us. And that's what Christendom, that's what empire does. In stanza four, um, you know, I talk about God speaking to us, right? Uh, he spoke to us through um, example. Uh, and he also spoke to us through, through pages, right? So I talk about... Uh, how we sloughed the example that he gave us and how we have broken pages. And actually, in the written form, I use the word P-A-I-G-E-S just to, you know, because everybody would think broken pages you know, in, in terms of communication and writing. And I wanted that intent there too. But I also used P-A-I-G-E-S because um, we, as pages to Christ, right, um, sort of, apprentices to Christ, we ourselves are broken because we have sloughed the example and because we've broken uh, his word, his written word, and we, we don't listen to that. We therefore are also broken pages, broken apprentices. So there's a, a threefold meaning from those two concepts that I, I list out there. 
And then, of course, I, t- I talk about in Santa Four how we redefine peace. And that's something that uh, we talk about a lot here. You know, at the end of episodes, when I say, um, you know, I'm peace, and I'm, because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it, that's all basically you know, <laughs> this idea here, which is that um, you people who want to go out and kill others and are calling for the, the deaths of Palestinians and you're not calling for ceasefires after kids are getting murdered, um, you know, that, that's your definition of peace. That's what you're saying brings peace. And um, I just, I hands down disagree that that is, is peace. I think you've redefined what peace is and call it peace, and it's, it's really not. Um, in stanza uh, five, um, if you compare this to Longfellow's poem, right, he says, he comes to a place of despair where he says, there is no peace on earth, I said. And here I'm, I'm saying the opposite. You know, Christendom's like, hey, finally, we did it. We established the, the peace that Christ himself couldn't even do, right? We established it, right? There's peace on earth because we're in power. And so it's a, it's a direct contrast to Longfellow there. And then finally, um, in stanza six, uh, it's probably the stanza that I, I don't want to say I like the least, from, from this poem in Longfellow's. Um, but, you know, he just says, you know, then the bells rang louder and deeper, and he said, God isn't dead, or and he doesn't sleep, because the wrong's going to fail and the right's going to prevail. And it's just a bald assertion there, which I agree with that assertion, but it, it's just, it seems very unsatisfying, you know, um, to ground your hope in this, this future thing that seems so unreal, like at a moment like the Civil War. And um, and in regard to Israel Palestine, you know that's actually one of the things that that I I despise um, is this grounding of of current action in the future, um, and and so that's the these uh, dispensationalists who um, lots of issues with dispensationalism in general, but putting all those aside, um, this idea of dispensationalism that well you know Israel needs to come back and be a nation and all that stuff before, um, you, you know, so that Jesus can come back. And so therefore, we're going to support Israel and everything. And because they think that the future is is a particular way, they think that therefore, they can morally justify anything they do just about to make that future come about. Which reminds me exactly of, you know, Sarah and Abraham. What did Abraham do when God promised him this future? And Abraham's like, well, uh, you know, God wants this future, then I'm going to bring it about how I must. I'll lie about Sarah being uh, my wife or sister so I can preserve my life because, you know, God needs me to accomplish this. Or uh, I'll sleep with my, I'll force my my servant to sleep with me, have a kid with her. Um, he does all these things to try to bring about God's will, and he ends up screwing things up because he's, he instead of trusting God, that doesn't show a trust in God that shows uh, a trust in self and and uh, a looking to self. So for my version of the poem, I am grounding my hope, not in uh, a bald assertion about what the future might bring or might be. Uh, and if, instead, I am grounding it in something that was shown to be um, in a way that has, has proven to be true. Um, you know, in, in the last poem, I say, you know, God's not dead. That's true. But he, he is asleep. And then I point to Jesus in the manger, you know, where God laid down his divinity, or not his divinity, but, um, you know, Jesus didn't, didn't see becoming like God as something to be grasped, right? He didn't grasp at that power, but he laid that power down. Philippians 2, kenosis, all that stuff. And so it's in a manger where we find our hope and our example to do what's right. How can the Palestinian Christians say that they don't justify violence even by the powerless, they can say that because of an example from the past, not this promise of the future that they can use to justify whatever actions they want to take to try to, to grasp at the power they think that they need. And so that, that peace, that true peace, um, that true hope came to a manger in Bethlehem um, where the empire sought his life. And it's, it's quite ironic and tragic and all of that, that in Bethlehem right now, similar circumstances are, uh, are going on all around, um, if not 
like I said, if not as bad as in, in Gaza as it is in, uh, in Bethlehem as it is in Gaza, nevertheless, still, um, you know, there's, there's been oppression for a long time and there's, there's always that threat. So right now, the empire that I'm a part of, the United States, and Christendom at the helm, we are fanning the flames of empire, of, um, of violence, of destruction, and we are calling that peace because uh, rather than listening to the, the church bells and um, recognizing their connection to a savior of peace, to a savior of lowliness, we, we hear the war drums and we think that that is our hope. So I hope I did not do injustice to the great Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, I, I, again, I appreciate the movie that they made about him and, and his life and um, what he did with God gave him where he was at, you know, um, being an abolitionist um, and, and all of that. He did magnificent work in, in a lot of ways. But uh, this is one of those blind spots in Christendom that, um, that hopefully I can add to the conversation and uh, help us to see a little bit more, more clearly, even if not fully correct. Uh, hopefully it's a, it's a tempering force for um, the war drums that, that so many of um, people in my group like to hear and follow. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.